in which we batter the triple platter from the only band that matters. This is The Righteous Bo Jambo, and it's time to talk about The Clash. In December 1979, The Clash released at London Calling, that rarest of beasts, an impeccable double album. Almost exactly a year after that, in what must have been one of the most mystifying cases of an artist overreaching their cells, they released Sandinista, that all too common of beasts, a bloated, dull, overthought and underprepared record that, to some extent, increase their mystique as artists who did what they wanted and the heck with the man, but to others it represented the ultimate example of a band believing their own hype. Time to gird up the loins and dive in. The Clash have become, historically, a band who seems beyond criticism, with the noticeable exception of Cut the Crap, which was a Clash album in name only. In fact, sometimes it seems, and especially in these politically charged times even more so, to be a race to extol increasingly the higher virtues they signalled in their best work and to reconstruct or gloss over the times when they weren't so great. A little history lesson is therefore called for. That sense of untouchability is built on a ferocious run of singles through 1977 and into 1978. Initially snubbed by the punk movement because of their taking a £100,000 advance from a major label in the form of CBS, to counter this they successfully branded themselves as the only band that matters and released Incendiary 45 after Incendiary 45. White Riot, Remote Control, Complete Control, Clash City Rockers, White Man in the Amersmith Palais, Tommy Gunn, English Civil War. Their first album was spotty, but when bolstered by the pick of these singles and b-sides, the American import version of The Clash is an essential artifact. It was, in fact, the biggest selling import album in US history to the time. 1978's Give Em Enough Rope suffered from unsympathetic and overly metallic production by Sandy Perlman, as well as some very weak songs. Stay Free is particularly egregious. After the rest of 1979's singles missed the mark by some distance, as well as the Cost of Living EP, they retrenched with reprobate genius Guy Stevens as producer and bought out London Calling. Famed for its eclecticism, London Calling succeeds on the strength of its songs. Well-chosen covers, tales of romantic and idealistic outlaws, flashes of humour and a fatalistic sense of social mission. It's the music which wears its ambition well and, while challenging the band's limitations, respects them and pushes hard against them. And subsequently, of course, became the album against which everything The Clash would ever release again was judged and inevitably pale. The band remained prolific in the wake of London Calling and within a year the follow-up album a triple disc package which legend has it the band agreed to take significant royalty cuts and deferments against to a get it released and to b do so at a price their fans could afford sandinista which brings us to the number of the video to swim against the tide of a romantic revisionism i'm just going to come out and say it at the beginning sandinista is a really bad record a bad record full of weak songs which seems to be given a pass because they all have this new sound which is muddled, murky, over-reverb, over-confected and a mess and a pale imitation of the dub that they're trying to invoke. In fact I'll go further, this is a terrible record, too glossy, 
two up its own ass philosophically and about two and a half albums worth of material too long, sounding like a band bloated on its own ego and spending way too much time in the fabled spliff bunker. And there's the title. Yeah. Let's name our album after a murderous terrorist regime which disappeared about 50 people a month on average. That's a statement of our identity. We're communist mass murderers. The problem is the songs though. There are too many of them and yet there are too few, as only a bare handful would have even gotten a second look into getting onto London Calling or Santanista's follow-up Combat Rock for that matter. The best, The Magnificent Seven, Crooked Beat, One More Time, Midnight Log, Kingston Advice, might stand a chance but they aren't better than anything that made London Calling, although Bank Robber, the unincluded single, would have made the cut. And the worst, Something About England, Rebel Waltz, Ivan Mitch, G.I. Joe, Men's Fourth Hill and the truly abominable Hitsville UK to name but a few, wouldn't have been out of place on Cut the Crap. The rest is either marginally above the worst five I listed, pointless and redundant, unworthy of the legacy of the band with such a reputation, or a sad indictment of how much they've hobbled themselves with the production on this album. Can you honestly say that Police On My Back wouldn't have been infinitely better done by the 1978 mark of the band? Certainly, there's a lot of styles here, but in the end they just bleed into one dull sounding hodgepodge. Diversity is strength? Not in this case. Going by the old six side format, let's work through the record. Side 1 kicks off strongly with The Magnificent Seven, one of the handful of worthy tracks on the entire two and a half hour shebang. Featuring Norman Watroy of the Blockheads in place of the otherwise engaged Paul Simonon. Catchy and silly, the song does presage a lot of the developments on what were to come in a somewhat more downbeat form on Combat Rock. From the penthouse to the pavement then, as Hitsville UK, very possibly the worst song The Clash has ever made, and one of the worst songs any major act has ever put on an album as anything but a joke, follows. A duet between Ellen Foley and Mick Jones, its overblown production and facile melody make it sound more like The Wiggles than The Clash, and that's the current version of The Wiggles, not the classic version of The Wiggles. And it goes on forever and ever. I know part of Sandinista's intent was to confound people's expectations of The Clash, but this beggars belief. Another overlong and pointless effort is track three, Junko Partner. But that said, it is better than the truly awful Ivan Meets G.I. Joe, which is a prime exemplar as to why you should never let your drummer write songs. The leader is trite and may have been better were it not for the claustrophobic production. And the less said about the execrable something about England, the better. Side 2 contains one very good song, The Crooked Beat, Paul Simonon's contribution, which, like his Guns of Brixton, serves as the mythic heart of the record, and a very good one in One More Time, where the production and playing suits the electro-dub fusion they were looking for. The rest veers from the wretched Rebel Waltz and Somebody Got Murdered, to the pointless uh, Mose Allison's Look Here, which sounds like a band giving it an extremely tentative run-through. Side 3. Apart from the fact that Lightning Strikes is almost exactly the same song as The Magnificent Seven, yet madly inferior, Side 3 is absolutely faceless, bland and forgettable music. Not one song there seems to have any reason to exist. There is nothing better than mundane. Just this constant beige cloud of mild annoyingness and the feeling that you have something better you could be doing rather than spending time listening to it. Side 4 is again inconsistent, the could be good if they didn't send an Easter eyes at police on my back, followed by Midnight Log is the only time on the whole album two better than 6 out of 10 songs follow each other. The Call Up and Washington Bullets are two of the more fondly remembered tracks, but the former is tuneless, droney and too long for my tastes, and the second too sweetened and radio friendly for its gritty subject matter. I accept there may have been a valid ploy at the time, but that doesn't hold its validity over time. The Equalizer is forgettable and Broadway is fatuous rubbish. It's on the third disc 
that things get really messy. Side 5 has the usually well regarded Charlie Don't Surf which I just find numb. An underdeveloped melody, a plotting arrangement which sounds like it was played by a cruise ship band and no air in the production. There's also the sloppy but at least interesting and thankfully brief Kingston advice and the undervalued junkie slip. But there's also the dreadful street parade, the dreadful, dreadful men's fourth hill and the dreadful, dreadful, dreadful lose this skin. In an album full of mystifying selections for inclusion, these last three are particularly puzzling. There seems to be an almost bloody-minded determination to push the album to three disc length whereas two discs were necessary to hold the sheer volume of quality on London Calling. Three discs, as it turned out, was banned hubris at record company politics, CBS having apparently hassled the band over London Calling's running length, pushing for a single disc, while releasing renowned musical meathead Bruce Springsteen's far inferior The River double set, apparently without issue. So the cut price overplied Sandinista was some kind of statement of artistic independence. Side 6, where you think some kind of summing up exercise might dwell, is instead a collection of versions and dubs that do nothing more than erode the legacy of a great band. The version of Career Opportunities is insulting not only to the legacy of the band, but to every fan that has ever invested in that legacy. In summary, let's play a game. I'm going to suggest a running order for a single album made up from bits and pieces of this, some of which aren't very good, and you, my dear listeners, can settle in over a plate of biscuits, I'd recommend Delta Creams, and a cool beverage and ponder its merits, flaws, and perhaps suggest your own to enlighten me. I will stick to the 43 to 44 minute limit for vinyl albums, as was the fashion at the time. Side 1. The Magnificent Seven. Police on my back, one more time and the dub version, up in heaven and the leader. Side two, the crooked beat, version city, midnight log, junkie slip, Kingston advice and Washington bullets. Well, wasn't that jolly fun. In conclusion, Sandinista, as issued, is an album that does not even manage to equal the sum of its and even my cursory attempt to salvage it as a single disc based on its better parts isn't convincing, although I am absolutely certain others could do it much better. Of course, as my selection indicates, I have the benefit of hindsight and the considerable rebound that Combat Rock was to give the group, so I can cherry-pick the tracks at best point towards that. But for the clash with Sandinista, the Casbah at this point remain most steadfastly unrocked. Good morning, meine Freunde. I hope you found today's presentation to be interesting and that it piqued your curiosity or outraged your sensibility about the infallible and uncriticizable clash. One commentary or coloration I'd like to make on the commentary is uh, regarding the song Ivan Meets G.I. Joe, where I suggested that uh, it was good enough reason never to allow drummers to write songs for your band again. Topper Heaton, of course, did write Rock the Casbah for Combat Rock. Um, Joe Strummer rewrote the lyrics and Mick Jones added the electronic arrangement to it. But uh, rather ironically, Rock the Casbah being the song which uh, got the clash out of Hock that they went into for um, making Sandinista. Topper, for his troubles, was sacked from the band in May 1982, and he's not in the video that made the band famous with the MTV generation uh, a little later on after that. That's Terry Chimes, their original drummer. Question is, was I too harsh on Sandinista, or did I accurately grasp the consequences of its overreach and its underplanning and overproduction? I would value your comments in the section below. As always, thank you for coming and watching. Feel free to leave a like or subscribe. And always remember that you can't know where you are at until you know where you've been.
The more I think about it, the more happy I am that it is as it is. I can only say I'm proud of it, warts and all, as they say. It's a magnificent thing, and I, I wouldn't change it even if I could.